You're listening to Reach MD, and this is Lipid Lumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, your host. With me today is Dr. Harold Bays, who is chair for the National Lipid Association's expert panel on adiposity, obesity, and dyslipidemia. We're here at the National Lipid Association's annual scientific sessions in Las Vegas. Harold, thank you very much for being back on Reach MD. I know we've done several interviews with you, but this was really an amazing accomplishment. Um, as you know, I just saw the document yesterday. It looks extremely con- comprehensive. So I understand that this came out of a NLA-sponsored consensus conference in September that occurred in Charlotte, and this included opinion leaders in adiposity and dyslipidemia, and the, and the findings were just uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology. So tell us a little bit about what the background was, You know, why you thought there was a need for a document on adiposity and obesity and why the NLA should be the one to come out with this consensus document. Okay, well first of all, Alan, you know, thank, thanks for having me here today. Um, but you're exactly right. What happened was, you know, we just found it curious that uh, whenever people talk about uh, increase in body fat, you hear a lot of talk about the diabetes and you lot of talk about the blood pressure, but even though uh, the most amount of the triglycerides are fats, they're stored in adipose tissue. And the most amount of your free cholesterol in your body is stored in adipose tissue. Yet despite that, you didn't hear a whole lot of talk about the interrelationship between an increased body fat and dyslipidemia. And we found that to be very odd. Uh, so what we did is last year, you're correct, in 2012, we had a consensus conference uh, where individual presenters you know, presented their materials and there was a lot of feedback. You know, it was a very lively session. Uh, and then just, uh, you know, this this year, then we kind of compiled all that into one consensus statement. So this this will re- represent, you know, kind of a sentinel resource for people to go to if they want to, you know, determine the relationship of what happens when you have an increase in body fat and what happens to lipid levels, as well as what happens if you have a decrease in body fat and what happens to lipid levels. I think there needs to be a resource for that. That's what this document does. Yeah, terrific. And I, I looked at some of the members of your panel, and I noticed there were some people there who are experts in weight loss, you know, that aren't necessarily lipid geeks, and the other people who are interested in diabetes. So did you address those other issues in addition to the lipid abnormality? Well, I mean, there, there you go. That's spot on. That's the whole point. Uh, you know, when we, when we do, so I do a lot of research with weight, weight management therapies, weight management drugs and such, and, you know, they're dedicated trials in patients with diabetes mellitus where they look and see, you know, how much hemoglobin A1C reduction are you going to get with the use of these weight management drugs. But I challenge anyone to find, you know, a series of, of clinical trials of weight management drugs specifically in dyslipidemic patients. And that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make clinical sense. It's not good for clinicians, and it's certainly not good for patients. So, you know, one of the things we kind of hope to achieve with this consensus statement is to you know, kind of highlight the importance of dyslipidemia in patients who have excessive body fat, and maybe they, we can kind of get that research that we really need to evaluate these weight management therapies that are now coming online and see exactly you know, what happens to lipid levels when you administer uh, these weight management drugs to dyslipidemic patients. So Harold, can you walk us through just briefly the process? I mean, we've got in, in the game of doing these consensus documents. I had the privilege of being involved with the inflammatory biomarkers document, but probably our audience, many of whom are, are practicing physicians, would be helped by getting an idea of what's the process? How do you get a panel together and what's the process of starting and then achieving a document at the end? Well, first off, let me just say that biomarkers document was fabulous. That's the kind of, you know, statements that need to be made that, again, w- you know, what's the criteria? Scientifically valid, uh, it, it helps clinicians, and it's in the best interest of patients. Those are my three criteria when you come up with any kind of, you know, consensus statement. And, and, that, and that biomarker paper, you know, certainly did that. So congratulations there. Uh, and here we try to do the same thing. So as you, you're correct, that we try to gather a, a diversity of individuals. So we had lipidologists, we had bariatric specialists, and we had, you know, people that are very much involved in the, you know, mechanistic, uh, uh, you know, understanding of the relationship between body fat and dyslipidemia. So it was a, a whole collection of a wide variety of people. But I think the thing that, we, you know, we've kind of learned politically, uh, and I think you need to, you know, it needs to be said, this was not funded by industry. Uh, none of the speakers were paid any money for this. This was purely for the benefit of, you know, of NLA members, not just NLA members, but all clinicians, but mainly because we felt that this was in the best interest of patients. 
Yeah, that's terrific. And then once you, it, obviously with consensus documents, the reason they're not guidelines is you're answering some questions that are still questions, right? So you're taking your best shot at, at a lot of things. So how do you vet all that? Do you get everybody together, they all make their presentations, and then how does that translate into a document at the end? Yes, and then everybody you know, kind of writes a section, then everybody kind of reviews the sections, and uh, look, I, you know, I'll just speak for as one, you know, I reviewed the document many times. Now, I will tell you, hopefully it's just confidential between you and me, okay? <laughs> so maybe nobody's listening, Another okay? secret, and you heard it right here on ReachMD, <laughs> Lip and Lemonation. <laughs> Is, uh, look, it's one thing if you're writing a consensus statement when there's already been like 40 other review papers. Then, you, then, then the matter becomes, you're just picking and choosing those points of view for which you agree or disagree, right? So, yes. so that's, that's challenging, but not as challenging. Here, there had never been anything like this written. So I fully expect that there's gonna be some challenges. There's gonna be some people that say, you know, I'm not sure that's whatever. But, but my point to everyone is, you gotta start somewhere. There has to be somebody that does the first thing. And if it means it puts yourself out there to be a target, then so be it. Yeah, well, congratulations. Looks like it's a fantastic document. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals, and I'm your host, Dr. Alan Brown. I'm here with Dr. Harold Bays speaking about the NLA Adiposity and Dyslipidemia Consensus Document, recently published in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology. So let's get back now. We talked a little bit about the process and the need for such a document and the fact that there's uh, not a lot in the literature about the lipid effects of many of our approaches to uh, weight reduction. So can you tell us a little bit about the, in the last seven to 10 minutes that we have about the, the key findings, the, the key points that you wanna make that the document clarified for us? Well, certainly. Uh, you know, the first thing is we spent an extraordinary amount of time in discussion of uh, the potential benefits of nutritional intervention and physical activity. We felt that was crucial. Because in fact, when you look at the typical dyslipidemia you see in patients who have you know, uh, an increase in body fat that results in adipocyte hypertrophy and visceral fat accumulation, you know, what we call dysfunctional fat or the adiposopathy. I think we've spoken about that before on ReachMD, where you have the sick fat. Um, what you typically get is an increase in triglyceride levels and low HDL cholesterol levels. And, and what's clinically relevant for clinicians as well as patients is there is no lipid parameter that responds better to lifestyle intervention than high triglyceride levels, you know that. And, um, and so we spent a considerable amount of time, you know, talking about how it is that, you know, the, the low carb diet is really effective in lowering the triglyceride levels or how you can increase HDL cholesterol with, um, with increased physical activity, but to really increase HDL cholesterol, you have to undergo not just vigorous activity, but really vigorous activity. So, so for all of the folks out there that are, you know, very, you know, interested in what is the potential for lifestyle changes? your realistic expectations for lifestyle changes, it's in the paper. But then we also moved on to the, uh, you know, the weight loss management drugs. Drugs do play a role in the care of patients, okay? And, uh, you know, there's been uh, some weight management drugs that have recently been approved, and we examine those effects, and it's kind of what you'd expect. If you, you know, the main benefit is the lowering of the triglycerides. Sometimes you get an increase in HDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol may go down depending if, if you get really substantial weight reduction. And then we even examined uh, the effects of bariatric surgery, which I think most people know this if you get the gastric bypass, because not only are you getting the weight loss, but you might be getting some hormonal effects. You know, that's when, you know, oftentimes you see the most dramatic effects upon improvement of lipid levels, but you also get improvement in lipid levels with the, you know, lap banding and, and sleep procedures and such. So, so again, all of these things uh, are discussed uh, in the document, in the consensus statement. So there's an old joke that the problem with willpower is it has a half-life of two weeks and it's soluble in alcohol. <laughs> so I think a lot of the people in our audience, uh, many physicians understand that you know promoting weight loss is good in many reasons for the lipid profile, for blood pressure, for reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes. But I think there's a, a general sense uh, of uh, discouragement among doctors that you know we can tell people this, but, but they're not going to really lose weight. So I wonder if you can comment, number one, did the document address that? Mm -hmm. What are the realistic expectations in terms of weight loss? And did you encourage people not to give up but to learn better how to prescribe weight loss? Well, that's the point. 
That's the point. Because uh, I think until you know that there is a significant potential, substantial potential, for improvement in certain lipid parameters, you, you and your patients may not be as enthusiastic about implementing, whether it be you know, uh, appropriate nutrition, increased physical activity, weight management drugs, bariatric surgery, whatever, until you have the foundation of understanding of what those effects may be, what the promise holds for improvement in lipid levels, maybe you're not as enthusiastic as you mentioned. But I just want to go back to what I said before, there is no lipid parameter that responds more dramatically than elevated triglyceride levels. And I can just tell you, you know, it's supported by the literature, but in clinical practice, you know, sometimes, you know, just again, implementing a low carbohydrate diet and encouraging, you know, some increase in physical activity can have profound improvements upon uh, elevated triglyceride levels. So if you were gonna tell the average physician how their first visit should go when they're approaching a patient who has metabolic syndrome, mixed dyslipidemia, yeah. impaired fasting, glucose, and they're overweight. And the physician in, you know, in good faith wants to do something to move this patient towards a healthier lifestyle, wants them to lose weight. What's the first thing they should do? And that's my question that's very important for you to tell the audience. And the second question is, are any of those strategies addressed in the document? Let me answer the uh, second part first. We don't really, we don't get really engaged in, you know, for example, uh, cognitive behavioral modification, those types of things. I mean, you know, uh, there was only so much, so many words we can put. I think if you see the document, it is, it is very. I mean, we've not talked about this, but it's very mechanistic based. It goes into exquisite detail about how an increase in body fat and adipocyte hypertrophy and visceral fat accumulation, it goes on the molecular level and describes not that it just worsens dyslipidemia, but precisely how it worsens dyslipidemia. So a very large part of the document is focused on that. On the okay? science, which on is the, the science. NLA's trademark, and I but congratulate if, you for but that. If, but if, to answer your question, what would I do? One of the first things I do, uh, you know, from the clinical side, is have people, have patients keep a dietary diary. And is it extraordinary when you have patient, patients keeping a, you know, dietary diary, and you haven't come back in a week? You know, one of the first things you notice is they've lost eight pounds just by keeping a dietary diary. And now you and I know that's not the calories that burned, writing down what they ate, right? It's just they're holding themselves more accountable. And then the other thing that's interesting, if you have people keep a dietary diary. They will inevitably come back the next week and say, you know, I can't believe this was the week you had me keep the dietary diary because I never eat like this. You know, there was a wedding, a birthday or whatever. Uh, I think what we've come to know is you can't just say go on a diet. That isn't going to get it done. Never, never going to get it done. You have to some way find uh, a methodology and a practical one and a cost effective one wherein a patient can just write things down, hold themselves accountable that you can look at the objective data, and I, at least for me, uh, that's been an approach that uh, you know seems to work pretty well. Yeah, I've had the same experience. You just have to pay attention to it, and uh, when you're writing it down and you reach for the Oreo, you think twice, <laughs> which uh, doesn't happen if you don't. Yeah, that's right. And uh, patients will have success with any kind of a structured program, but self-monitoring, as you just described, is the, the number key. one thing Huge. for behavioral modification. Yes. Any other comments about you know, how you hope that this new document will be used? As you said, the science is fantastic. I, I was looking through it yesterday when I got the first copy uh, handed to me, and uh, it's really a resource document. That's exactly right. It's a resource. It's the place, you know, if you want to know what's the relationship between either weight gain, you know, fat weight gain or fat weight loss, and you say, where do I go to find a review article on that? Or where do I go to find a statement on that? Up until this document, I'm not sure where you go. I don't know where you go. I think, uh, you know, Henry Ginsburg was a co-author on a paper that I thought was pretty good, uh, review paper. But other than that, I just don't know where you go. Now you got a place to go. Oh, any other comments regarding the uh, document that you'd like to tell our audience in terms of its utility? Or I think it's just another way to emphasize the fact that we, can get, that we need to get away from this idea that adipocytes and adipose tissue are these, these inner organs that all they do is store fat. It's not that way. Adipocytes and adipose tissue are both active from an endocrine and they're both active from a inflammatory standpoint and it really does matter. Sick fat really does cause, you know, diabetes mellitus, hypertension and dyslipidemia and the more that we keep, you know, doing statements like this, I think maybe the message will hit more home to patients 
that by losing the excess body fat, if you have metabolic disease, that there really is that opportunity to improve metabolic disease you know, through that sort of intervention. And then finally, obviously there's a lot of interest in bariatric surgery. Yeah. I'm kind of hoping that our solution for public health is not to have everybody undergo bariatric surgery, but um, you know, some interesting things about it, that even it looks like the diabetes gets better before the weight goes away. So any thoughts on the role of bariatric surgery and was that addressed in the document? Yes, actually we had an entire section on that. Uh, you know, and as I mentioned before, uh, uh, you know, if you do have substantial uh, weight reduction with bariatric surgery, uh, you can get substantial improvement, as you mentioned, in the diabetes mellitus and in the blood pressure, uh, but also in the dyslipidemia. And as you also correctly mentioned, you know, there's a, there's a large amount of thinking that it isn't solely due to improvement of the adiposopathy or the sick fat, that there may be uh, you know, additional mechanisms by which uh, they're improving these metabolic disease that have to do with uh, you know, alterations in gut hormones and interactions with the central nervous system and those sorts of things. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we have a specific section on you know, bariatric surgery, uh, the relative effects of different types of bariatric procedures and their effects upon uh, lipid levels. Well, congratulations, Harold. And you know, for the audience, th this document is a wonderful place to go where in one location you can get a tremendous free, amount free of Free online, I think. Yeah, free and, download online. And online. I'm Dr. Alan Brown. You've been listening to Lipid Illumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at reachmd.com slash lipids, featuring podcasts of this and other series. Dr. Bass, thank you very much for joining us, and, and congratulations on a wonderful document. Thank you very much.